Hi, this is Lindsay Oden, Special Research Assistant at the Washington State Attorney General's Office, and this is your AGO Moment in History. In this series, our office will be releasing clips from our Oral History Project, an ongoing effort to collect and preserve the history of the Attorney General's Office as told by the people who have worked here over the years. In this episode, former Deputy AGs Jeff Goltz and Shirley Batten interview former Attorney General and Governor Chris Gregoire. Gregoire served three terms as Washington State's Attorney General from 1993 to 2005. Prior to her tenure as AG, she had been hired as an Assistant Attorney General by Slade Gordon. She was later promoted to Deputy Attorney General under Ken Eikenberry, and she was the first woman to hold that position. She left the AGO in 1988 to head up the Washington State Department of Ecology. In 1992, she launched her first electoral campaign and was elected Attorney General. And again, she was the first woman to hold that office. In this clip, Governor Gregoire describes the mentors she had within the AGO and her time as the head of the Ecology Department, which led her to her first campaign and her election as Attorney General. Let's take a listen. So, um, uh, while you were both as a as a assistant and as a uh, division chief over in Spokane as a deputy, were there some people in the AG's office, in addition to say Slade Gordon and Ken Eikenberry, that really helped mentor you and that you, that helped you along in your career path? Um, well, when I was in Spokane, Bruce Clausen was my number one mentor. Um, he was responsible for implementing the new state law with regard to dependency and termination cases. And, and he was a lawyer with the DSHS division in Olympia. Seattle. Seattle. Yeah. In Seattle, yeah. right. And so he was kind of put in charge of making that happen. Um, and so he was a constant mentor uh, for me in trying to implement that and so on and so forth. And as we began to explode in terms of the numbers of cases and then began the process of opening offices and so on. That was Bruce, um, a guy who was always there for me. I mean, there are a lot of mentors, to be perfectly honest with you. Mona Cuco, when I ended up doing some tort cases, you know, came over, I'll never forget him, trying to explain to me, you know, it's like two robots, and your job is to get the other guy down. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then he left and went to a swimming pool. And I thought... This is my advice on my tort case. But he was right. Yeah. He was right. Um, uh, and Mackie, Ed, he was my mentor from the beginning, actually the beginning. Uh, and it got so that I would call him and say, okay, I, I know you don't have time for me. And how he ever had time, I don't know, from Spokane. But he never, ever refused or failed uh, to take my call and to help me out. But he has been a long-time mentor of mine, and I couldn't thank him enough. He's been amazing for me. We're going to be interviewing him in a month or so. Good. Yeah, uh, we'll ask him about you. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so then um, you were uh, you supervised the number of the resource divisions, natural resources, ecology, fish, and wildlife. And and then you worked on Navy Home Port, and you had spent some time with the governor's off the governor in the, in the Commonwealth Wharf case as well. And then, all of a sudden, there was a vacancy at the Department of Ecology, and there you were. So explain a little bit how that came about. Uh, so I actually got a call from uh, Booth Gardner, uh, and it was him, he was the governor at the time, it was him directly. Uh, what I didn't understand at the time was no one knew he was calling me. Um, they're a client, so I was aware there was a national search for a, a new head of ecology going on. And he called and he asked me if I would consider doing the job. And so we talked for a while on the phone, and um, I said I'd have to get back to him. And I thought about it uh, for a couple of days and called him back and said, no, thank you. And he said, well, keep this confidential because no one knows. And so I thought, oh, that's interesting. And about a week later, I get another call from him. And this time it's, I want to talk to you, uh, and I want you to come to the mansion, and I want you to come the back way, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll have lunch with you. And so, I mean, it's the governor. What are you going to do? Say no thank you. So I said, okay. And came out of that lunch um, saying yes. He was quite a persuasive individual. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I thought it would be a fun, exciting, challenging opportunity. It, it was a time when... That agency uh, was riddled with lawsuits, uh, and he had gotten to know me in comparable worth, and another case, but primarily in comparable worth, and he wanted me to 
get them out of all the litigation. And he thought a, a lawyer heading it up uh, would be the right way to go. He took much criticism uh, because, one, he didn't abide by the national search. Come to find out, his, his chief of staff didn't know that he was going to call me. Uh, he did it all on his own, uh, said he thought about it in the middle of the night and decided he was going to go with his gut. Uh, others didn't let him do that. He was going to do it on his own and no one needed to know but him. And voila. And uh, so there was criticism because I, quote, wasn't it, you know, dying the wool environmentalist and so on and so forth. But I went out there, loved, loved it, had a great time, and still stood in good contact with the AG's office because the division was so critical then to try and get us out of this, everybody has to sue uh, on environmental issues. So what was it like be, being a lawyer one day and being a client the next? How was that transition? Well, each time, uh, ecology and then governor, um, I was better for it. I was better for it. Better for it having been a lawyer, frankly, mm -hmm. but more importantly, better for it having been a public lawyer and come from the AG's office. Because I knew and I understood the respective roles. And at Ecology, I wasn't the least bit afraid to have my division chief sit in on my executive meetings and be a part of the discussion, and I could sort through what legal advice was and what just good sound advice was and so on and so forth. I welcomed it. I remember talking with the cabinet, um, the governor's cabinet, and saying, guys, th these guys are immense value to you. Don't just turn to them with some legal question. Of course you got to do that, and that's fine. But they have good judgment. They have good thoughts. They have good perspectives. And you ought to make them a part of your executive teams. And, and you know, if, if it makes you feel better, tell them to tell you when they're offering up a personal opinion rather than a legal opinion. But I felt it was immense value uh, for my having served in the AG's office. So uh, the views I'm hearing now, had, did those evolved over time? Because I remember in my time in the Attorney General's office, it was sometimes made clear lawyers in the Attorney General's office are to give legal advice and stay out of the policy realm. And you sound like you were kind of inviting them in to participate openly, but understanding where the difference is between policy and, and the law. Because if the truth be known, I never agreed with that policy. Okay, there you go. <laughs> it wasn't my policy. Uh, I under understand it. Right. I get it. Uh, but I'll tell you, having been the head of an agency and having been the governor, uh, lawyers give you more than legal advice. They give you sound, quality judgment with a perspective that is critical in making decisions. Um, vice versa, though. Vice versa. Uh, AG's office um, oftentimes believes that when they give a piece of advice to a client, the client must follow the piece of advice. Well, I'll tell you, having been an agency director now, that's one of how many people you have to listen to. That's one of how many perspectives you have to listen to. So as I tried to say it when I became Attorney General, you know, guys, if it's not illegal or unethical, then they have the prerogative, and you should tell them, okay, here's the downside, here's the upside. Don't tell them they just have one option. Tell them how many options they have. Um, that's the kind of valued advice, and that will make them be more inclined to follow your advice, frankly, than if you simply go tell them you can't do that or here's the only thing you can do. And I tried to do that with my cabinet when I became governor as well because I think there's a wonderful sweet spot there if each of the respective parties understands their roles but doesn't get stuck in this is the way it is, those are the corners, and you can't cross them over. We actually tried to incorporate that into AG Academy training pretty early on yes, yes. so that the new lawyers yes. would have some sense of that. Absolutely. Uh, let's turn to campaigns for Attorney General. <laughs> so you decided to run for Attorney General, and you did so first in 92. Uh, you didn't have experience in a statewide race at Naive the time. So. get out. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you decided to run, why you decided to run, and then your experiences maybe in each of the campaigns, 92, 96, 2000, um, and any tolls those took. 
So, first campaign was really encouraged by Booth and his administration, a number of people in his administration. And uh, amazing meeting one night uh, at um, Dean Foster's home uh, with Dean and his wife there and Denny Hack, um, former treasurer of the state, Booth, and so on and so forth, kind of explaining to me what it was like to be a candidate and so on, because I had no idea. Uh, this was my first run statewide. This was my first run, period, yes, since true, true. college. Um, so thank, thank goodness for naivete, because had I known, I probably wouldn't have run, but I didn't know. And so I thought, what the hey, I'll give it a go, and did. Uh, and I look back with the absolute fondest of memories from that election in the general, not the primary. The primary wasn't a very comfortable primary. Because um, you had primary opposition in the Democratic I Party. I did. I did. Uh, a pros I, I had a prosecutor uh, who was pretty, you know, feisty, let's say that. And the general election was just a first-rate prosecutor. And he, that wasn't his style. That was Norm Mailing. Uh, Norm Mailing. And uh, we went at it. We respected each other. Uh, and when we were done, and when we were done, we became dear friends. And we weren't friends before that. We became friends as a result of the campaign. I spoke at his eulogy. And that, to me, is what campaigns should be about. Now, I've never had another one like that since. But... That, to me, is what campaigns really should be about. Uh, when asked in debates, you know, what did I think of him, I gave him high marks and respected him and said the public can't lose in this election. When he was asked, he virtually said the exact same thing. Um, that, to me, is what campaigns are about. So that was 92. 96 uh, and 2000 uh, it was a odd, it was a, a one single individual who oh, had a lot of personal problems and uh, perennial, started with me, but then became a perennial candidate for anything and everything, and so we're, weren't much by way of races, to be perfectly honest with you, which was not good for me, because I got lulled to sleep, and then along comes the race for governor, which is a whole different world, and here I got lulled to sleep by the last two elections. Well, and we wanted to ask you that question. How, 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 did the, how does it compare running for governor compared to running for AG? Oh, there is no comparison. I mean, you get, as AG candidate, you kind of get lost in the, depends on whether you've got, we'll always have a presidential race in our state, okay? You've always got a governor's race in our state. You've always got all statewide electeds and so on. So you get lost in all of that. The leadership of the legislature is probably at stake, et cetera, et cetera. So you're one of a number, right? When you're running for governor, it's high stakes, and the scrutiny on you is surprising. Uh, and again, I got lulled to sleep in 96 and 2000, and again, didn't have experience, well, no one does till you do it, of running statewide for a position like governor or U.S. Senate. And um, it can be pretty bruising. That election, you know, made history. Um, didn't like it. But wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, uh, my opponent or me, to be perfectly honest. We need to go through multiple recounts. Um, but it, it, they're completely different worlds. Thanks for listening to this AGO Moment in History. Be sure to like and subscribe to receive updates when we upload a new episode. On our next episode, Governor Gregoire talks about transitioning into her role as Attorney General and how she managed a rapidly growing office. Thanks, and talk to you again soon.